and make Sunday school staff, and we thank them for, for all their love and effort throughout the year. So I'm going to give them a round of applause for it. Um, so tonight we're really blessed. We have a wonderful speaker, and I really wanted her to speak uh, just because, yes, I have a background with her, but I've always known her as pretty much the retreat center lady. She is the executive director of the San Diego Retreat Center, but I've also known her as a graduate of the seminary. She's someone who's very educated. She's a dynamic person from our travel. She grew up uh, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. In Minneapolis, St. Paul, where exactly? Minneapolis. Minneapolis, very good. Oh, she, yeah, so yeah, I don't want to say that. Uh, <laughs> she, uh, she grew up in the community of St. Mary's uh, Greek Orthodox Church in Minneapolis. And as well as we all know, as we said, she is the executive director currently for our St. Yacht's Retreat Center. Uh, she has a lot of fun hobbies such as running, fishing, reading, and naturally, just like myself, anything about potato chips. So we got good balls there. There you go. Uh, cheddar and sour cream. That's actually my favorite. What a coincidence, see? We got, we got some bubbling over here. Uh, so we're going to thank Rosalie for coming tonight. Thank you for having me. 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 Thank well, a couple uh, a couple of things that I guess you should know about me about me that Father did not tell you is that although I love running, I actually cannot play soccer for the life of me. As soon as you put a ball between my feet, I end up on the ground. It is completely impossible. And then also, yes, I do love all things potato chips, but I also believe in the superiority of ranch as a condiment. I recognize that may be a, um, a contested issue, but that's where I'm at. I believe in ranch, and I am a diligent follower of it on just about every food that I can when it's allowed. Uh, anyways, so uh, we're here this evening. Uh, I want to invite Father Chris for, or thank Father Chris for inviting me to be here with you this evening. Um, it's been uh, a while since I've been able to be at the St. Lucas Parish, so thank you for having me back, first of all. Um, and what we're here to talk about this evening is Great Lent, and our journey in Great Lent. But I'm going to be honest with you, Father Chris actually probably could not have picked a worse speaker for me on this topic. <laughs> um, the reason being is, if I'm going to be honest, Lent this year's specifically, especially, has been a little bit of a struggle for me. I would say my grade in terms of spiritual exercise would come back with big, bold words across the top that says, needs improvement in giant red letters, right? What I found is I just can't find the time to do the things, prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, that the church tells me I need to be doing during this time to prepare for what's coming. What I found in this first half of my Lenten journey is that because I can't do these things perfectly, I find a tendency to kind of just not do them so much at all and put them on the back burner a little bit. Um, one thing I have found time to do this Lent is watch TV before I go to bed. So <laughs> I started a show recently, it's called The Chosen. Has anyone heard of this, by the way? The Chosen? All right, The Chosen. Anyone else? Yeah, Chosen. Okay. So, for those of you who don't know, The Chosen is a story of how Christ chose his disciples, chose his followers, and it follows his story and their story in the Gospels, with some theatrical additions and interpretations to those stories, I'll say. So, disclaimer, if you're going to watch it, that's fantastic. Just make sure you're watching it in conjunction with Scripture. Better yet, maybe with a you know, synopsis of the four Gospels, but more on that in a second. So, as I was watching this program, one thing kept popping out at me, and it was a specific phrase, and it was a phrase that would come up in regard to Christ and his ministry. It was something that often was asked, if not now, when? So, one specific time in this theatrical interpretation of scripture that this phrase was said was when Mary... Theotokos, Christ's mother, asked him to perform a miracle at the wedding of Cana. So she said, hey, we're out of wine. Could you help us out with that? And he said, and she goes, but if not now, 
way. So, I am by no means a biblical scholar. Yes, I have a degree from the seminary, but I'm not a biblical scholar. But I was pretty sure that this phrase in particular did not appear in scripture, especially at these points. So, I went to this book. It's called The Synopsis of Four Gospels. The reason this book is awesome is because what it does is it takes the gospel accounts from the four gospels and lines them up next to each other. So you can compare what Matthew and what Luke said about the same passage in scripture. Right? So I open this book up and I go to the wedding of Cana. And sure enough, across all the different accounts, what I found was, even though I found Christ saying to his mother when she asked him for help, woman, it is not my time, which is my favorite. A son telling his, his mother to back off. Relax a second. Right? Classic, by the way. My brother does it all the time. Anyway, although I found that in scripture, I did not find Mary's witty comeback. If not now, when? Yet, for some reason, I couldn't let this phrase go. It was nagging them. It had to have a meaning because of its poignant use in scripture, or in the story, in this program I was watching, but I didn't know where it came from. So I turned to the source of all information and the place for all answers. I Googled it. <laughs> I Googled it, and I Googled it, and I Googled it. I was searching for, if not now, when in scripture. I would find similar phrases, like in Proverbs 27, 1, boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what the day will bring. Or John 13, 7, Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. But I couldn't find this particular phrase, and I couldn't let it go. This is nagging at me, poking like a puzzle. I couldn't figure it out, but I knew it was important. I just didn't know why. Well, lo and behold, as I was scouring the internet, trying to find this phrase, what I realized what I was doing was actually procrastinating. Because, see, Father Chris asked me to be here with you this evening. But as he mentioned, my service in the church is through the retreat center. So stuff like this is out of my normal routine. It's not something I do on the daily. And so, because it's not something that's kind of within my wheelhouse, I was procrastinating preparing for it. And I was using, trying to find this stinking phrase as the way to do it. Turns out, I did find it. The phrase is in the talk. <coughs> um, now, the Talmud is the Hebrew word for learning. The Talmud is a collection of writings that covers the full gamut of Jewish law and tradition, compiled and edited between the sixth and the, uh, the third and the sixth century. The implications of the title, learning, implies that people should devote their lives to studying and mastering it. So I found my phrase. But it wasn't in scripture, it was in the Talmud. Well, that wasn't helpful. What I further discovered was it was said by Hillel the Elder, who is one of the most influential rabbis in Jewish history. He lived from 110 BC to 1080. To this day, his teachings and lessons are integral to, Jewish, uh, to the Jewish perspective and practice. He is popularly known for two famous sayings. The first, which is very close to something we find in our scripture, that which is hateful to, to you, do not unto your fellow, for that is the whole of Torah. The rest is explanation. Go and learn. Sounds a lot like the golden rule to me. And then secondly, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? And being only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? So in my research, not only did I find my phrase, I also found that it had actually been paraphrased throughout centuries by many famous people. JFK himself actually said this. I also found a second component to it. 
not only what, my first question, but who? Here, in the 21st century, this Jewish rabbi from this first century was calling me out on procrastinating. And he had the audacity to also ask, who? Implying me. So, this time in our church, this period of 40 days, is known as Great Lent. A time intended to be a contemplative existence of intentional internal and external action. A time to be aware of oneself, the entire self, and spiritually exercise each piece of us. Through this exercise, we grow closer to God and better prepare ourselves to celebrate the joy of his resurrection, our salvation. This time is to focus on us, our personhood, our humanity, to develop and grow, and in doing so, become more like him. But what are we? What is personhood? What we know from Orthodox Christianity is that God is one and three. Three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but one God. Incidentally, human beings, who are created in the image and likeness of God, are three parts in one person. There is, there is a triune aspect to our existence. One aspect is the physical, the external, the tangible. A second is the internal, the mental, the emotional, the intangible. And the third is that which is spiritual, the part that connects us outside of ourselves. Three different pieces working together in one perfect being. That's a human being. So that is to say that a human cannot simply be found in our body, nor is it just our soul. That's why as Orthodox Christians, we believe in the entire body resurrection, because no one piece of us can be separated and for us to still be whole and be dwelling eternally with God. This is why during this time of great length, spiritual exercise, prayer, fasting, and alms giving, are intended to grow and develop the different facets of our personhood and bring us into a more holistic connection with God. Make us more human. Make us more like the creation he created. This past Sunday, I actually saw it in the church on the altar. We celebrated the elevation of the cross. So I have a theory. The elevation of the cross is to great length as recess is to a school day. I'm going to say it again. The elevation of the cross is to great length as recess is to a school day. In the middle of our Lent journey, we stop and we lift the cross, the symbol of life, and we process it for all to see, to remind us what we're working towards and encourage us to keep doing our exercises and preparing our entire selves for the joy of the resurrection. In this, this is a small reprieve from the struggle that these exercises bring, to remind us what we're struggling for. It gives us the energy to finish the journey, to complete the course of the fast. Just like recess is that energizing break in a school day, the raising of the cross is that energizing break that we need to keep journeying in great life. So with this spiritual ascesis, this exercise that we, so what is this spiritual ascesis, this exercise that we just took a break from? Well, we've heard it already. Prayer, fasting, and all of it, right? And to do these exercises during this time, the church has given us some tools. We just did one of them tonight for sanctified liturgy. The middle of the week to come together to worship and to feed the person. Additionally, Atticus hymns on Friday where we reverence the Theotokos, and in that reverence, plead for their, her intercession and help. Many parishes also offer additional services such as orthros, compline, vespers, and other ministries that take place only during Lent. These are what the church provides, and through them, ways to grow during this time. 
But how are we, how, when we are not in church, are we supposed to do these exercises? Because it's not limited to just when we're here in this building. Since our recess is over, right? The break's done. We're already halfway through our Lenten journey. It's a good time to stop to take a look at these practices and investigate where they come from and what they mean to our development. It's a good time to evaluate how we're doing. So let's take a look at them. Let's start with the first, fasting. Fasting is not explicit to the Orthodox Church. It's actually practiced in one form or another amongst many religions. Fasting is as old as the human race, although expressed differently throughout. If fasting is as old as time, and seen throughout traditions, we have to ask ourselves, in our tradition, where is it rooted? For us, the answer is Orthodox Christian as to where we find fasting in our tradition. Well, it's in scripture. Perhaps the most famous example, and one from the most concrete roots, or in one of the most concrete roots of fasting, is in scripture, found in the New Testament, in the life of Christ. After his baptism in the Jordan River, he withdrew to the wilderness where he spent 40 days and 40 nights in prayer and fasting in preparation for his sacred ministry. We've all heard of this one, right? Okay. But what if I told you Christ's fast is not the first fast? And in fact, fasting in our faith and in our tradition is actually much older and the roots are much deeper. It is recognized that the first fast was actually Adam in the garden, when God gave him a command. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it, for in the day that you do, you will surely die. The fasting in paradise cons consisted of abstaining from a certain food, abstaining from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, I think we all know how the story goes. Adam goes the fast, and we were expelled from the garden. So, St. Basil the Great writes in his first homily on fasting, because we did not fast, we were chased out of paradise. Let us now fast so that someday we may return there. Father Alexander Schmemann, as he talks about fasting in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, states that fasting is not merely an obligation or a custom, it's connected to the very mystery of life and death, of salvation and damnation. Fasting for Lent is not only tied to the very spiritual development that we're trying to seek as we prepare for Pascha, it is connected to our creation in Genesis, the creation of humanity, of personhood, and our salvation in the New Testament. It's our way of returning to paradise. So, um, we know that fasting is connected to the development of the entire person in its holistic totality. It's tied to our creation and to Christ himself. It's not an obligation or a task to just undertake during Lent. It's actually a tool through which we become more human. We become more like the way God created us. Fasting in the Orthodox Church has two aspects to it, the <coughs> physical and the spiritual. The first one employs abstinence from rich foods, dairy, eggs, all kinds of meat, rich foods, etc. Spiritual fasting is consists of an abstinence from evil, evil thoughts, desires, and deeds. It is to focus on what is both going in and coming out. See, this is another theory of mine. In the Orthodox Church, there's constantly this tension between opposites. We just said going in and coming out, right? Physical <coughs> and spiritual. You see this in other places in our church as well. God is love, but he's not love because he's greater than love, and he's bigger than anything that you could know of love. You can fully know God, but you cannot ever fully know God. He 
because it is greater than anything we could fully understand. Or something even simpler. God is one, but three. Right? The tension between opposites is what brings balance in the middle. So in our fasting, we cannot do one without the other. A complete focus on what's going in while neglecting what's coming out is not balance. And focusing on only what's coming out without thought of what's going in is also unbalanced. It's only by pulling on both ends of the rope that will become taut and balanced in the middle. All right, our second, I think I missed something there. <laughs> oh, I did, all right. We won't jump ahead yet. So, <laughs> fasting is essential for us to regain control of our bodies, to lighten our load, and make it easier to pray, to restore discipline to our lives. Fasting brings about purity of heart and returns us to that paradise-like way of life. Fasting is the foundation and the preparation for every spiritual effort. After all, it was God's first command in the garden. Yet fasting alone is not enough. What we see in the church is fasting is closely coupled with prayer. Or as St. John Chrysostom puts it, these, fasting and prayer, are like two wings that carry a person to the heights of God. Now, our next group of people, prayer. In the Orthodox Church, we have both communal and individual prayer. And we are not only called to participate in both, we actually need both. Again, attention between opposites, singular prayer and pluralistic prayer. Two ends of the spectrum. Why do we need both? Well, because of the nature we were created in. God formed us in his image and according to his likeness, Genesis 1.26. And he is one but three, singular in being and relational in being. And this is the image we were created in. We cannot truly be ourselves without communion. It's actually for this reason why solid punishments like solitary confinement and isolation are so effective. We are not meant to exist apart from the other. We find our balance in the singular and in the many. And this also translates to prayer. Communal prayer in our spiritual exercise during this period is important. We've actually already covered some of the ways that the church does it for us and gives us additional resources during this time. One of them being tonight. Um, I actually have to say, a little bit of a digression here, that the imagery that we find during this period of Lent um, is unbelievable in our work. The language that Jews is so deep and so rich and so beautiful. Um, my favorite is actually on the first Friday of Lent during the Akathis hymn. Um, so the, the service to the Theotokos, the priest chants, Hail, or O Purist. The scroll on which the Logos was inscribed by the Father's finger. I mean, we could spend an hour talking about imagery and services and worship, but luckily for you, Father Chris didn't give you that kind of time, so we'll just move on. Um, <laughs> yes, it's just my of course, of course. So in addition to these communal prayer opportunities, we are called to private prayer. During this time of great life, how are we communicating with God outside of the church? Do we have private prayer? If we do, how are we doing it? What are we saying? Is it authentic? Is it true? Or is it just what we think God wants to hear? Alright. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm trying to communicate God through prayer, I feel a little bit like Greg.
provision for the other, for the person behind you, next to you, or in front of you. Almsgiving is being called for forgiveness. By forgiving others and asking for forgiveness, we are doing good to people and to our own soul. This can absolutely be considered, considered a form of charity. And Great Lent is an excellent time to practice these virtues. So, as we look to our relationship with food and our communication with God, we also have to look to our relationship to others. The intention, um, um, that is the intention, alms, hold on, I lost my place, sorry. Um, <laughs> with almsgiving, it won't only be done at the moment of opportunity for somebody who we recognize as needy, somebody who is in a different life state than we are. Almsgiving, especially during this time, should be given to each person that we encounter in a way in which they need it, whatever that may be. All right. So the Lenten journey is an exercise of the entire self. Growth of the whole person, both internal and external action. As we enter this last half of our Lenten journey, let us adapt our thinking. And instead of thinking of our two separate circles, our Lenten tools, prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, and the circle of our well, who we are as human beings, body, mind, and soul, let's meld them together. Because these tools that have been given to us, we found, are not outside of us. They're, they've actually been a part of us since we were created. And the reason the church reminds us of them during this time is because it, how it helps us develop and become more ready to celebrate in the joy of the resurrection. And just remember, as much as we would like, we can't have it our way. Lent is not like grocery shopping. You don't just get to walk up and order one large fast and a prayer to hold the almsgiving. You don't get to choose which ones you want and which ones you don't. They're all a part of life as you are multifaceted yourself. And most importantly during this time, we have to try to be as authentic and true as we can and not be doing things and pretending to be in a place that we're not. We shouldn't be saying only what we think God wants to hear. And why? Because as Hagar puts it in Genesis 16:13, the Lord God sees which, by the way, if you haven't, can't tell by now. Um, <laughs> I'm a huge fan of the Old Testament. Everybody likes that New Testament stuff, right? Like Jesus, his life, the miracles, the stories, the fathers. That's great. I love those too. But I really love the Old Testament. Such wisdom there. Such grace. And also incredible information about who we are and really who God is. And the thing is, is God sees us truly. He knows, our, he knows when our prayers are just boasting. And when we're participating in worship with community, but we're not making the space and time and taking action for the other once we walk out these doors. He sees us, and during this time, he just asks us to try a bit harder, to put in the extra effort, and not pretend or be inauthentic. So then... The problem is, we often get caught up in doing things the right way, right? The right way. That leads to us not doing them at all. Because I can't find the time to pray to God outside of worship. I can't find the time to stand in front of my icons and do the prescribed prayers. Should we be looking for that? Absolutely. But what if we can't? Often because we can't, we just don't. We don't pray outside of worship. We live in a busy, fast-paced world. We live in a busy, fast-paced world. 
We don't have the time to go to the soup kitchen. Should we be working towards doing that? Absolutely. But if we can't, because we can't, we often don't take the time to do anything. We don't take the time to really consider the other at all. The ask of us, of us at this time is not to do it perfectly. It's just, as Nike says, to do it. In whatever capacity and whenever we can. And if we can't do it perfectly, not to use that as an excuse not to do it at all. God knows our hearts. He recognizes our intention, no matter how small we feel the action is. Because as he says in Psalm 139, or as it says in Psalm 139, you have searched me, O Lord, and you knew me. He knew you before he created you, and he set you apart. Also, Jeremiah 1, 5. Lent is halfway over. The resurrection is upon us. Prayers, fasting, and almsgiving, they're big words, and we've been hearing them for how many days now? But they don't have to be big action. And if we can't do big action, it shouldn't stop us from doing action at all. We, most likely, are not spiritual giants, and God is not asking us to be. He's asking us to be authentic to our humanity and grow in his likeness as we approach his resurrection. This is not an obligation, it's a choice. And you have a thousand opportunities a day to make that choice. God knows our hearts. He knows if our effort will be in vain. He will know when the simplest of prayer is said in humility and honesty and true longing for relationship with him. He will recognize when the simplest act of service is a true reflection of him in the world. He will know when the slightest abstinence from food or thought creates just a little space for him to fill. So, our recess is over. The time is coming. It's our choice as to whether we meet that time with joy or trepidation. So as we embark on this last half of our Lenten journey, remember to ask yourself daily, if not me, who? And if not now, when? <laughs> comments we're going to offer to uh, Ms. Tegas over here? Um, yes? No? Don't be shy? No? Okay. I love no. All right. She loved that for something. Well, let's give her another round of applause. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you for your time. God bless you. Good strength with everything that you do and for our metropolis accordingly. Uh, and I just want to thank all of you for being here tonight again. We'd like to thank our Sunday school staff for such an off awesome offering tonight at the Lenten Meal. God bless all of you for your strength. Join us for the following services that are coming up. Uh, we wish you all a blessed continuance in the great Lent. And just like Kentucky said, there's a reminder to fast, to pray, and our almsgiving. giving. God bless you, Kentucky. Thank you. God bless you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for everything.